Daniel chapter 1, so I was going to start Daniel chapter 2, which I had that and studied it all week, but early this morning, I was awakened with this verse on my mind, and so when something is so on my mind, we're going we're gonna to stay in Daniel chapter 1, I'm going to look at the last verse, and we're, we're preaching through Daniel, of course, living with lions. As Nebuchadnezzar, not to do the history, listen to two Sundays ago where I dive into its specific history of what was going on, uh, you know, 605 down to 586. Nebuchadnezzar, his his kingdom, he was, the legend was, is that he rode on a lion with a snake wrapped around its neck. We know that was just a legend, but lions was on the Istar gate. Lions was part of that even going into Darius. Now, Nebuchadnezzar would burn you up. He, he, put, he put folks in the furnace. Uh, the three in chapter 3 when we get over there was not the first three folks that he put in the furnace. He'd been baconizing people for many a year. Uh, however, Darius and Cyrus the Great, they put folks in the lion's den. And we know that's a Uh, a powerful story in the book of Daniel. And then we know that in Daniel 7, as we look at the animals associated with the kingdoms that we'll get into next week of Daniel, of Nebuchadnezzar's statue, and it's interpreted that God is over the affairs of men. In the time of the Gentiles, God went ahead and told Daniel, starting with Nebuchadnezzar until its conclusion of kingdoms mixed with iron and clay, that man always has tried to carve out kingdoms. It started with gold, which was an expensive metal, but yet it goes down to iron. And iron was the least expensive metal. Uh, However, it's a lot more durable. What it's saying is that, Father, we get in the conclusion of the times of the Gentiles, there's going to be an iron fist of humanity and authoritarianism over the church. And that persecution will fall up underneath it. But don't lose heart, ladies and gentlemen, because there is a kingdom that supersedes all. And it is one that is not made with hands. And there is a stone. See, you and I like to get our hands in everything. Religion, church, stuff. And I'm going to bring that out. We think humanism is just outside the church, but it's not. We all carry our philosophies, and we get so hard-headed that God can't use us. We get stifled. But I'm telling you, there is a kingdom. It was the kingdom in which Abraham was seeking after, whose builder and maker is God. And so everything we do is kingdom work because that stone, it was the same stone that Moses, when he went and spoke to the rock, and it came forth, water. We like to think that that was a small pebble, but that is not the Hebrew word there. This was a massive rock, like a rock of Gibraltar. (laughs) And we think it was a little stream that two million people went in the wilderness and was waiting their turn in line. That is not what happened. (laughs) What happened was is there was a river in the desert that flooded through the middle of God's people. And God can still give rivers of water in the midst of desert situations. That's the kind of God we serve. And so when we understand that we're serving a God and his purpose to supersede ours and our agendas and what we're trying to accomplish and our little uh, pragmatism of making God as a means to an end that God has liberated me from several years back. I'm not in the camp of trying to let people use me and using God and using this and this job and using as a way to an end. This thing supersedes me. If God tarries and I'm dead and gone, this is about the kingdom work of God and us pursuing him. That stone that is not made with hands is going to crush the statue. So no matter what you see taking place on world stage, understand that God is sovereign over the affairs of men. I will be more detailed than that and chronicle its history, give you the Babylonians, the Persian Empire, the Grecian Empire, the Roman, what that looked like, tying it in next week and and, and some of those dreams and visions and does God still use 
dreams and visions and and does he still speak that way? And let me just say this, because I get a lot of questions. And people will come to me and say, man, I had this dream. Is this God speaking to me or not? Because there is a, a view that God no longer speaks to people that way. And they'll use a verse in 1 Corinthians 13, when that which is perfect has come, and say that's the Bible. But however, when I speak to those people, they only say that that perfect was only the King James Bible, in which is the one I use. Uh, but however, upon further study, that's not what that's saying. Uh, that's not in the confines. Here's what I will tell you. And this is why I tell people who come to me and said, man, God, is like, or God spoke to me, and it seems like there was a lot. Okay. Because I get a lot of God spoke to me's. <laughs> And God spoke to me. God, and I do not see anywhere in Scripture that God has ceased speaking to folks that way, even though it's in the minority of group. But always understand this. Dreams and God speaking there in an unconscious state is never a first word God gives. Ever. It's never first. It's always second and third. God's word is his first word. This is the first word. So if you're dreaming anything that goes outside of God's word, that is not God speaking. It is taco soup. <laughs> and I'm not trying to be light and make light of something that startled you in your dream. But if it's outside, if you dreamed that I was climbing up this uh, mountain of spaghetti and I couldn't get to the top and the sauces was just not letting me get and meatballs was falling on me. And I feel like God has just judged me for my past. I'm never going to reach my potential and my purpose. And I feel like that's what God's telling me. I'm telling you, that is not what God's telling you. And you just dream something due to an unconscious state because of something you ate. All right? So let me clear that up because I do get that a lot. God's word is God's first word. The Holy Ghost never goes against the Word. They are one. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Men were moved by the Holy Ghost as they pinned down the Word of God. And He has spoken to us through His Word. Lock yourself in into the Word of God. It is God's first Word. However, God does send second and third words. That's what happened to Nebuchadnezzar who already had a first word from a prophet, which prior to the completing of the Bible, there were prophets who came and spoke divine revelation to folks. He already had that. And so he had first word to compare to the dreams. But I want to look at the last verse. We have outlined the first chapter, <clears throat> the verse that is just sticking with me. And I don't want to pass it over. I, I I woke up with this stuck in my spirit, and I jumped up, and I said, God, this is on me, but I, I got this ready, <laughs> that I'm polished at. I got the dates polished back down in my mind, and I'm ready to go with the times of the Gentiles and talk about these dreams and get into that. But however, I got to preach what is heavy upon my shoulders, and this is it, and it's in verse number 21, and Daniel continued even unto the first year of King Cyrus. Let's not fly through that verse. The word continued in the Hebrew means to come into presence, to be present. In other words, to allow God's purpose to be present in your life. In other words, it is being present. You can allow God to be present in your life if you're not present. But it is God, and that is 70 years. Out beside that verse, you need to put 70 years of faithfulness. Continued, keep it going. We're going to see in the next several chapters, as well as this one, as we'll finish up, there's a lot of challenges to hit Daniel. Keep in mind, Daniel was possibly around 14, 15, 16 years old in this text. And there was a lot of things that he was confronted with here that he had a made up mind, but for the next 70 years and kept on going into another kingdom. But as it relates to this verse, he stayed faithful. Through a lot of stuff, through a lot of frustrations, a lot of controversies, a lot of people selling him out, a lot of people he thought was friends, and they, he landed up in a lion's den. But however, that's where God wanted him, to show himself right there. And so how do we continue? So I'm going to talk about contributing factors for a Christian to continue. What do we see in Daniel? That is contributing. Now, last week we talked about being purposed to the core, having a purpose in your life, and why do you do what you do? 
being purposed, and we took core, and, and you can go back and look at that, and talked about some things that Daniel was purposed in. Now, some things that helped him continue. What is it going to take? What's some contributing factors in Daniel's life that I am seeing that I can apply to my life to help me have longevity, continuing? Through the difficulty of being young and saved and single. Huh? With the rise of smart technology where you can go hide in the room and get into all kinds of stuff. You don't have to go to Egypt now. Egypt's come to you. How are you going to continue through that? How are you going to continue? You get married and you got kids and you got to jerk the whole kitchen sink now <laughs> with you when you leave. <laughs> and you get to church and say, what are we doing here? I can't hear. I sit down and this one's crying. This one's doing here. How am I going to continue through that phase and season of life? How are we going to get through when things start happening and I don't have finances for this and this is frustrating and this kid's now doing, taking some moves and maybe going south and, and you're in that stage of life. How can you maintain and move on through a hardship, maybe the loss of a loved one, a son, a daughter? How can we continue through? Keep in mind, he lost his parents at a young age. We don't know if they were killed in the 605 invasion by Nebuchadnezzar. Possibly was. Nebuchadnezzar, as I read, the first deportation when Daniel was taken from Jerusalem to Babylon, they killed a lot of the nobility, a lot of the priestly family. When I read some of the history, we're not really sure, but Ezra may be alluding to Daniel that his family was part of the Levitical priest, and Nebuchadnezzar executed them. He possibly seen his family executed in front of him. So this man has faced some stuff. This man is going through some stuff. What about when you get a little older and your kids leave the house and you're going through this stage and now the kids are gone and I don't even know you anymore? What about what grandparents say? What, what, why are we going to continue longevity? Let me give you some contributing factors, I think, that I find here in this text um, from the beginning. Some of it is reading in. It's called metadata. Metadata is read the text, and not that I'm reading into the text, but you look at the history and understand somebody had to name him Daniel. Who do you think did that? Okay, his parents. It's not difficult. <laughs> his parents. More than likely named him. <laughs> ah, Daniel. Daniel, God is my judge. What is that telling me about them? Right? So I can look and see this man purposed in his heart at a young age. Somebody spoke into his life. Somebody had to speak into his life and get it in and get it in early. So the first contributing factor that I want to share with you is, is just that. It's parenting. Now, that can bring up a lot of ups and downs. If I was to say who would do some things different, we probably all need to raise both of our hands and our feet. Um, if you say, well, I tried and I got some family that just went astray, I feel like such a failure. Well, God has a lot of his kids that go astray. Would you say he's a good parent? Well, I'd say he's pretty faithful. You say, I've been through this and divorce. God knows what divorce is. Matter of fact, it said that he divorced his people in Jeremiah. Well, that's powerful. You say, boy, I've never seen that before. Yeah, read the Bible. It's going to explain a lot of things. Because of his people, what they felt and their rejection of him. And he faced that. And so if you're suffering from a distant relationship from a child, I am not here. Or if you have been unable to have children. Let me just say this first as it relates to Daniel. We must speak about parenting and what that looks like because Daniel had some that spoke into his life. And so what's the key factors? I'm not going to get into you about child discipline. I can tell you that, yes, I had to go pick my switches at time. You're going to get a switch and furthermore, you're going to go pick it. What? I'm going to pick my switch. That could be a good or a bad thing. And I went and I picked one. I thought, well, it would be good because it's real small. And I just realized this, the thin ones, doesn't, you don't want them. <laughs> them things hit you multiple times on one. 
Then I figured out I'd go and be gone a while, and then I would hear the ever, the longer you take, the worse it will be. Because <laughs> I wouldn't come in the dark on those occasions. So I'm not going to get into that. Or, you know, this one, I remember me and my cousin arguing, and we were 11, 10, 11. We were just doing some silly arguing with each other, and I was at their house. And my uncle was a big country guy and he had, they had horses and here's how he would discipline horses he would flip them right in the head I've never seen anything like it and when he flipped somehow he enlarged his hand waved his finger way back here <laughs> how is that even possible and when he flipped you heard it so pow he'd flip a horse right in the nose and that horse would listen to everything don't do that and they do it and he'll flip it and that horse is following him around <laughs> I mean it, it worked <laughs> just flip them in the nose son just all right, right. So we were arguing out at the barn one time, and it was just something silly, and we was just going back and forth, being cousins around each other all the time. About that time, Uncle Charlie come right up behind Jamie, and he flipped that ear. I mean, he went down, ugh, that went down crying. I was laughing. <laughs> I didn't know that he circled around behind me and took aim. <laughs> he flipped my ear so hard, I'm telling you, it felt like it exploded and it come around and hit me right in the no ear jokes because I know I got something to work with. He had a good target. <laughs> uh, but when he hit that sucker, I felt like it come around and hit me in the mouth. <laughs> I went down and never experienced pain <laughs> like that. I'm not telling you that's the way you need it. I'm not getting, in, you know, there's ways. Here's what I know that Daniel's parents succeeded in. And that's where Daniel understood who he was. In God. <laughs> he understood who he was in God. He was Daniel. Because this world will try to change your name. <laughs> First thing they tried to do, you go, name will be changed. Schools will try that. Universities will try that. Culture will try that. But the most powerful influence is that God is in aided in parenting is your voice in their life. Well, if you adopted those parents, whether if they come into your life, if you're a grandparent, speak life into them. Let them know who they are in God. We understand the, the areas of, of discipline and all of those things, but let them know who they are. This man, this boy purposed in his life at a young age, and we're crediting that to some family that's, that lived out, number one, that told me because nothing's new under the sun, that he had some parents that lived out what they told him. <laughs> Boy, don't do uh, what I do. Just do what I say. Try that. Try tearing things down and your kids hearing you ripping people apart and then tell them, you don't do that. <laughs> okay, try that and see how it works. Son, y'all go on and just go to church. Daddy's gonna, you know, not going to. All right, try that and see how faithful and I. And so... Daniel was able to live to his name. And by the way, it says, and Daniel continued, not Belshazzar. If you and I live underneath the name that this world gives us, we will not continue in this thing. We'll fall off like flies, like we're seeing a lot of believers in Christian these days. Falling off. Falling prey to a name that this world has given them, what success is and what life means. See, there's a lot of things facing let me just bring it into a little bit of a concept. Nebuchadnezzar was rebuilding Babel, all right? He's rebuilding Babylon. Going back to Nimrod, who said that we are going to make a tower that goes into heaven. Now, they weren't trying to make a tower literally to go up into the clouds. What that means is, is humanism is going to top off, and there's nothing above humans. There's no new philosophy under the sun. Pragmatism. Relativism, all right? Um, evolution. That is not new. We understand this concept in the 1860s of Darwinism or evolution, is 18, but it was long before that. <laughs> here at the Tower of Babel, we will make our tower. It's going to be here where we declare what is right, what is wrong, because there is no God. See, the heights doesn't go into the heavens. We're building our tower because we are God. There is a philosophy now that is permeating in our culture. It permeated here. 
It's the reason that you can just change your identity just at any realm and, and not be who God has called you to be. And I told you before, every time that something happens in the kingdom of Babylon or Persia, they don't say, go get Belshazzar. This world don't need a bunch of worldly Christians living on the fence, not faithful to anything. They need a Daniel who is purposed. When a dream happens, go get Daniel. Forget that garbage. This world knows what they're diving into is dead. It doesn't offer them anything. Wellhausen, John Dewey coming in with progressive education. And now education is not based on facts. <laughs> Let's not do that. Let's make everything relative. Let's let a child just see where they want to go and just let them take them and be. No. Forget social engineering. Teach them the basics. Reading, writing, arithmetic. And let everything else fall on uh, parents and, and truth. And, and so all of this is facing. I think about the big fight as, as I went through and was teaching. I wasn't around for there, but I wanted to know what the feel of the church was during the late 1800s and early 1900s with what they call the fight between liberalism and fundamentalism. So you as a liberal... You was a fundamental, and you had to make your choice. As a lot of the German theologians from Hegel, when you had the thinking like uh, uh, Immanuel Kant and these different ones, if I'm giving you some of these names, it's, it's, it's because I have uh, taught this, and it's not that I'm trying to be smart. I'm just trying to say that it was a philosophy that universities took, and they taught teachers, and teachers come, and it's just so it's just been eroding in for 100 years. Uh, of teaching some things, of pragmatism and evolution and higher, really it's humanism. So when it comes to the church, it looks like liberalism. I know this is going to blow your mind, but it also looks like fundamentalism because I was on this side, but still humanist in my thinking. Let me digress. Liberalism started saying there's no supernatural stuff and and let's not get crazy. Higher critics come in and said Jesus didn't walk on water. That was just the way the Bible. And when it's talking about heaven and hell, it's really just talking about perceptions and a higher perception. And, and that's what it is. Hell sort of having a bad day and stuck on side of the road. And, and that's really what that's speaking of. You can sort of have heaven or hell on a daily basis. And so liberalism was to make you happy now. So everything's about making you happy now. So what was involved in liberal theology brought in things like modern psychology of Sigmund Freud. That everything's based on our desires. That your desire, specifically sexual desire, you just fulfill all of that and kids is based on that. And by the way, you look at some of his, and I'm not, but they hold that man up and he done some of the most vile practices on kids. Blows my mind that we held him up as this great psychologist of modern psychology and we use his philosophy. He was a tyrant and tortured. And it's really unacceptable that any college professor would even use him, but that's where we are. And so theologians... <clears throat> To go against what God has to say, which I will say more about later, and this is why I'm just branching off. It's important how we disciple and train our kids. Parenting. So Sigmund Freud, there, and it engulfed in the church. Harvard, Princeton. Did you know that they were seminaries to put preachers out? Dartmouth. All these Ivy League schools were some of the most Powerful schools putting out preachers to the colonies, setting the stage for great awakenings. And so, however, the enemy's not scared of all of that. He went right in there and said, hey, listen, let's go hire critic the Bible. And let's make it really say something it doesn't say. Let's attack that. And let's say, let's just because we know human nature, and let's let people just live and love and laugh. And let's throw God out the door, but keep religion. That way you can come and say some poetry and get in your little style and your little where you feel comfortable and people dying, <clears throat> leaving with no Jesus, no changed life. It's the reason that how can churches confirm this and affirm this? 
I told you last year, uh, my greatest heart, and we're going to work on some First Stone Ministries coming in. It's people, it's gender confused. It's fighting some things. The church does two things. They hate them. We hate them with all the name calling, or we affirm them. And we're doing them damage both ways. And we need truth. Fundamentalism, you say, how is that human? So there was a reaction. And I love some, you know, Mason and some of these guys that come out, you know, uh, on the fundamental side. And they had to have a reaction. And the reaction is, is there's five things that we believe in. <laughs> and these five fundamentals of the late 1800s, which I agree with them, by the way, on doctrine. And the first generation had some stuff. But then in the fundamental side, salvation became if you check the box. If your box was you believe this, you believe this, you don't want to go to hell, do you? Okay. And that was salvation. It was just checking the box. And so now salvation was you're checking a box. It's religious. We're coming doing our duty. We look like this. We do this. And if we get outside of this, we're not saved. Doing this, this. And saved was based on all of that. You check a box because we're making you happy later. And all came about saving people from hell. And let me tell you, I believe in hell. But it, and we all say, well, Jesus preached it. Jesus did preach it, and it's real. But it wasn't his chief motivation to get people saved. It's a benefit. Heaven's a benefit. Yet yeah, we understand where we're going. That the early church had than just that. And so now the fundamentalists became just in their boxes. And everything become a boxy, what we were comfortable with. And you were saved if you checked these boxes. And they both went into ditches, humanistic thought. To continue, this thing is a personal, live relationship with Jesus Christ and to know who you are in Jesus <laughs> and that we are here to serve our generation by the will of God as David did and what God has given us to help us with that is parenting. Now, <clears throat> you say, boy, I've done some mistakes and I'm doing here and I'm just praying. Well, maybe seek God. If you got an alien child and it's away and this, maybe reach out and say, listen, you pick the counselor. Well, I made some mistakes. You tell me when, I'll pay for it, and we'll go, and we'll start on a renewed path. Maybe that's needs to We need to help parents in these days. Some of you, you say, I've raised my kids, I'm done. No, you're not. God's called you to help out in the body of Christ. There's a lot of fractured folk that bought into this philosophy of John Dewey and Wellhausen and Immanuel Kant and Nietzsche bought into that, and look what we're left with. A lot of shattered lives. It's going to need some folk. It's going to come and help them know who they are in Jesus and discipling and mentoring. So that is one aspect. If we're going to have longevity, let's get them when they're young. And let's implement them. Don't think it, it's Stalin when he said, give me your child till he's five and I'll make a communist for life. Don't think it was by accident that Adolf Hitler targeted the youth. No, it was purpose because there's a lot of zeal there. There's a lot of looking for meaning and why am I here? Let's tell them the truth and who they are in God. Let's not get them offended and walk around to your offense and, well, don't go in there. I go ahead and tell you, above anyone, the most dangerous place I bring my kids is in church. And let me digress. Because in church is where they know I'm not trying to be something I'm not. <laughs> I want to be better in delivering this. I want to get better at it. And I, I try to uh, preach it and teach it to the best of my will, but I'm not something here and something else the next day. And who knows that's my kids. And so when they see folks and me invest life eight, nine years, and all of a sudden, where are they at? Uh, I don't know because we're not running no one down. Where are they at? Where are they at? And they see that it's a danger zone. Well, how can I trust anyone? When they're like, hey, how are you? Love you. Boy, I just can't believe, man. I just love you and all that. And all of a sudden, where's the love at? So don't tell me the most dangerous places are public schools and our universities. Daniel done pretty good in a pagan culture when they know who they are in Christ. So the greatest thing we can do is be right and real and tell them who they are 
I'm not standing here for one family and who's not. I'm here of a higher purpose. This is kingdom work. This is I've got to stand before God and I want to hear well done, my good and faithful servant. <laughs> and if we're reaching out and doing things to reach the folks for the cause of the gospel and someone gets offended, we've never done that way. Well, I'm sorry. Go find where they've always done it, but we're going to take Jesus out into the public and tell them. Why? Because we know who we are in Jesus Christ. And we want others to know who they are in Jesus Christ and strong parenting and feeding into your lives is the greatest thing you can do. Kids, you say, how am I going to combat social media and all this? I'll tell you how you combat it. You stand and be who God wants you to be as a parent and you watch how that will have a greater voice in your kid's life than any other. I'm going to go through the next ones very quick. Number two, preaching. I'm going to go through these in five minutes, so Listen, if I start speaking real fast, I'm still speaking English. <laughs> uh, preaching. I told you who he would have heard preach. And guys, I'd have liked to have heard him. But for years, Daniel would have heard Jeremiah preaching. From the world, he was not a success. Do you think about the success of Noah? He only convinced seven people to get on an ark and preach for a very long time. As a preacher, he was an ultimate failure in the world's eyes. <laughs> As a boat builder, he was pretty good in the world's eyes. But I'm telling you, he's mentioned by faith Noah. <laughs> by faith Noah showed up and he preached. <laughs> and he was doing it and he preached. And, and so Jeremiah was preaching. He was being smacked in the mouth, thrown in jail, being this. And you're going against the God. You're going against all of this. Babylonians was coming, faced with all of these, what we'd say, political issues. And, and should we wear masks or should we not? And should we do this? And should we take that? And should we get this? And should we do that? And all the things. I'm going to say, ask God for discernment uh, in your little world, but watch how preaching will help give you discernment in a lot of areas of your life. God has chosen the foolishness of it. And Daniel would sit there, I, in my opinion, I can't find it, but he was in Jerusalem for 15 years with Jeremiah being the prophet of God preaching. And I'm telling you, there was a hunger in him listening and preaching, and it affected him, and he was listening. There was a voice speaking into his life as some of you are getting it this morning. <laughs> some of you are daydreaming and thinking about what's next, but some of you, God is zeroing in. Boy, there's got to be more. There's got to be something real to that Jeremiah the prophet, even though nobody's listening to him, but it sounds like music in my ears. I love good preaching. I'm not one, but I love it. I love it when it's bad. So I, feel that kind of, I love it when it's good, when it's preaching God's word. Good preaching to help you continue in this thing. Purposing in your heart will help you continue in this thing. You know, verse number eight, it's purposing, have a made up mind before you get there. I tell my players when I coached, go ahead and make your mind up. You're stopping the baseline. If you don't cut the baseline off, I'm taking you out. That's what I told them to start off. If you don't shut the baseline down and help the helper, you're coming out of the game. I don't care if you're scoring 40 and you're hitting everything. You don't stop that. You're coming out. So you better purpose in your heart. You're going to do it now. <laughs> if the child of God don't come in here, I'm not going to be offended. I'm not going to be one of those that's offended because of titles or where they took my seat and I'm normally there or, well, I didn't really care for that song and, and I didn't really care what they were. And, and do you see them? They had a new car. They get a new car every other year. <laughs> I'm going to purpose in my heart and I'm going to be offended. I'm going to purpose and say my purpose of coming here is I'm going to be in my position and live out God's plan of my life and love on some folk. And my eyes is going to be on Jesus and not myself and others, we're going to practice what we know. When Jesus concluded the Sermon on the Mount, he said there's two types of people that just heard my sermon, and every one of you will leave, and you're going to fit in one of these categories. We're going to leave here, hearing the same message. And Jesus said one of them is going to go out, and you can read it, Matthew chapter 7, and look at the difference. One of you is going to apply what you just heard. Others, you're going to hear it, and you're not going to apply it. You're going to leave the same way you come. And some storm's going to hit you this week, and your whole world's going to feel like you're upside down. Oh, Lord, I don't know what. I'll tell you why you're not applying God's word. This man's life was turned upside down. 
Two years later, he's asked to interpret a dream at 18 or 19 years old in which the king would not even tell him. He had so much God about him because he's practicing. Here's how God is. You're not going to get no father until you apply what you know. <laughs> when you start applying what you know, he's going to give you some more. And he's going to give you some more. This man was able to live out. You want to continue in this thing? Practice what your wife, pre- <laughs> what you hear preach. <laughs> I love the world that you got. Praying. I'll get in this next week. You go into chapter two. Something was hit them. They didn't go to the philosophers. They didn't call the preachers done it for a hundred years. They didn't do any of that. And I believe in counsel. He said, boys, we're all going to be cut out of here. What do we do? Shadrach asked. He said, boys, go and call on the God of heaven for mercy. And they had a prayer meeting. And don't, this ain't a prayer meeting with three people. <laughs> Because those three had a prayer meeting. Daniel was over praying, and God, in a vision, showed him not only the interpretation of the dream, but what the dream was. Praying will help you be, and then praising. I bless the God of heaven in chapter 2. I'll be more specific next week. But when God started speaking to them, it said they blessed God. When the Jews blessed God, it was hands raised. Hands where you say, well, that's not my worship style. Okay, let's just stop there, and I want to hear that. And when you and I get to heaven and Jesus is walking down center aisle, let's see if you sit there and say, this is just my prayer. Man, don't give me that. When the king of the universe comes walking in, don't give me this. This is just the way I worship. Okay. <laughs> I'll tell you what you're going to be doing. You're going to be standing up and saying, thank, praise, be unto him for his unspeakable gift. And I wouldn't even be here if it wasn't for you because I know myself and I know my sin. And thank God Jesus went all the way to Calvary's cross. So I'm going to lift my hands and praise the God of glory. If we're going to continue, you better get in on praising God. It is a source of strength. It is the joy which we do. That's why God gave us my favorite group in the world. The Mylon Hayes family. It's my favorite group in the whole world. I was listening to you last night. Y'all sung a song, that new resurrection song. And then I listened to that one, Resurrection Power, and had straight up church at 1230. And I was trying to go to sleep. And you guys kept me up to 2 in the morning. (laughs) Aren't you glad what God has given and gifts to the body of Christ? Let's thank him and praise him. These are some contributing factors that I want to get in on in my life to make a difference. Why? Because I want to continue. Continue means to be present in what God is doing in your life. God's wanting to take you places, and just like as a game, and one of my players don't show up, he can't be effective. Where's my, where's he at? I overset. What do you mean you overset? It's game day. You don't oversleep on game day. I had one, and I wouldn't let them ride different cars. No, we ride the same bus to away games, going as a team. Because one time I had one get stuck in traffic and wasn't showing up on time. It's game day. God wants us present and in uniform, serving him with gladness in these days. Father, we thank you for the good grace of God. Thank you for the book of Daniel, how it gives us <clears throat> insight how to live in a pagan land. And God, we don't need the right circumstances. We don't need 1900 again. We, we don't need that. God, you've called us. You're the same God that you've always been. And that same resurrection power that brought Jesus from the grave is at our disposal. And so God, may we leave encouraged that we can do this thing because it's not in us. That God, even when we up and we fall, you pick us back up. God, I have made and will continue to make parenting mistakes. Thank you for being a God who walks with us. And God, we know our helpless estates. And so God, would you help us this morning with these truths to apply to our lives. Thank you for faithful men who stood preached. Thank you for those who give of themselves just walking in their calling. Thank you for our music team. Thank you for music and the gift of music. Families that travel, protect them. We love them. 
In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand.